All right, so the problem we're looking at uh, today is uh, from the Forces and Fields Unit. Uh, you should download, print off the problem sheet before you start. So uh, I've, I've uploaded the sheet. It's uh, a charge to mass problem. So it's talking about charge to mass ratio. And just to give you an overview of the history behind this particular question, because there's actually a lot here. Um, the context here is actually relevant to the discovery of the electron. So if you remember, we talked about Millikan and how he did that oil drop experiment to have the oil drops levitate in the air. Uh, remember that he balanced the gravitational force and the electric force, and he found that um, through some really ingenious work that um, the oil drops all had were all multiples of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. So basically, through all that work, he'd found the charge of the electron. Um, what Thomson did um, was he found the charge to mass ratio. And when we talked about Millikan, we didn't really mention Thomson that much. But what Millikan was able to do is when he found the charge for an electron, this guy had already found the charge to mass ratio. So if you have charge and the charge to mass ratio, well, Millikan also ended up finding the mass of the electron. So he found everything thanks to the work that this guy had done, okay? So Thompson found the charge to mass ratio, but he couldn't actually find the charge itself or the mass itself. That was done by Millikan later on. So uh, if you look at the uh, diagram there, basically a particle is being fired uh, through some plates and then it's being caught in a magnetic field. And remember we said that magnetic fields, well, by the third hand rule for charged particles, they bend things in a circle. So the particle goes through the plates, it gets bent into a circle, uh, and then the radius of that circle is useful in calculating the charge to mass ratio. So if you were to start this problem and look at this, I mean, obviously read carefully, read through the scenario you're given, analyze the diagram, and then take a look through all the questions. So A, we're asked to determine if it's a proton or electron. Uh, B actually wants us to verify, all right, what is the charge to mass ratio of the particle in this experiment the way they have the data? So we, gotta, we should get one of those two values when we, when we go through this. Um, C wants us to explain what physics principles we used in finding the charge to mass ratio. And then D asks us, all right, what if you change the charge on this particle? What, what, is that, what are the ramifications of that? So we'll start in A, use the diagram to determine if the particle is a proton or an electron. There is more than one way to do this. Uh, you could just skip A, go on to B and solve because um, they, they have the same charge. So what you'd find is if you did B and just put in 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, you'd find out which of the two it was there. But in A, what you can do is you can just use the diagram and use your hand rules because we've said that the third hand rule explains um, the deflection of a particle. So. If you look at the diagram, and I'm going to just put my sheet up, which you can't see, but you can look at yours, the particle is going from left to right. So remember in the hand rules we said the thumb is the direction of motion of the particle. So if you line up your right hand in the direction of motion of the particle, and then if you look at the magnetic field that's coming out of the page, your fingers are the direction of the magnetic field. So your fingers should be coming out of the page with the thumb in the direction of motion of the particle. So if you do this, when you get to that magnetic field, your palm is the force. So yes the right hand works because the palm would deflect the particle inwards into an arc like this, okay? If you use the left hand, your thumb would be going in the direction of motion of the particle. Your fingers have to be coming out of the page like this. You know, I look ridiculous doing this. And then by that, it should actually get deflected up like this, which is not happening. So basically, your right hand can explain that curl. You use your left hand, it should curl the other way. So what does that tell us? Well, right hand was for positive particles, so um, by the hand rules, this thing has to be a proton. It can't be an electron. So A is proton. Um, it's now going into B. Well, we know that our answer is going to be 9.58 times 10 to the 7. The calculations we do are going to show a proton for the charge to mass ratio, but we need to verify that. And how are we going to do that? Well, there's. Um, I'm kind of going to jump into the physics principles. Right now, I'm going to kind of answer C before I do B, because I, I need to have a plan before I do the question. And basically, this is what happens. That particle between the plates, well, it's going to get accelerated, all right? 
it gets accelerated from left to right. Um, so we've got unbalanced forces. Um, but we've also got conservation of energy there. There's actually two ways to do this problem. You could do kinematics or conservation of energy. And the final goal is we want the velocity of the particle when it comes into the magnetic field. Because what I'm going to do is I've said that, that when you get an arc like that, we're going to set the magnetic force equal to the uh, centripetal force. And what that does is when we set mv squared over r equal to qvb, we get information about q and m and we are able to use the radius in our calculations. So I basically need the velocity of the particle in that field, right? If you look at your formulas on your formula sheet, q, v, b, we need q, we need v, we need b. So I'm going to find the velocity of the particle as it enters the magnetic field. How am I going to do that? Well, technically here I'm using uh, conservation of energy because I'm using this equation which explains that if you've got a voltage or a potential difference, this is a change in potential energy the, per charge, uh, over here this gives you the actual change in energy of the particle and it's divided by Q. I have Q, it's a proton, and I have the change in voltage so I can find the change in energy. So let's do that. Uh, 184.45 is the voltage. I want to find my change in energy and Q it's 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs for a proton. This is where I said if you used an electron it wouldn't make a difference, right? Because they actually have the same magnitude and we're not worried about the sign here. So your change in energy here comes out to um, 2.952 times 10 to the negative 17 joules. That's the energy change of this particle between the plates. That's how much energy it lost as potential and turned into kinetic. So that's the next part of the problem. You need to realize that this change in energy between those plates is a conversion from potential to kinetic. So I'm now going to take this and I'm going to say that the change in energy is all kinetic. And that lets me find a velocity. So I'm going to do that here. Now the mass you're going to get that off your data table. It's 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. And we're solving for the velocity. Okay, so if we use this equation, we can find the velocity. You get the velocity of the particle going into the plates then, remembering the square root um, as this. And that's what we need, because ultimately, I'm going to try and plug that now into the expression I get when I make the centripetal force equal to the magnetic force. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a really great question because, I mean, we're going to use this later in the year. When we get to our nuclear physics unit and we talk about the history of particles, we're going to use this. Okay? So, I'm going to, I've only got so much room here, so I'm going to erase these calculations. So, take a look at this, write this down. We need this velocity uh, in the next part of our analysis, okay? So we've now found this, again, this is the velocity of the particle right as it enters that magnetic field region. Okay? And what's useful about that? Well, remember from physics 20 when things move in a circle, that's the centripetal force. What's acting as the centripetal force here? Well, it's the force of, it's a magnetic force that's bending it in a circle. So I'm allowed to do this. Remember, different forces can bend things in a circle. It happens to be a magnetic force here. So I'm just going to write expressions for these. This one's mv squared over r. And then the other side, well, it's a particle, so we said q, v, b. And this is where you kind of had to have the foresight to know that you, uh, you had to use this expression here. And the nice thing now, well, we can do some manipulation here. One velocity, this is the velocity of the particle on both sides, so it, it cancels there. Uh, we want to find the charge to mass ratio, so I'm going to move the m down. And I'm going to do some manipulation here to get q over m is equal to the velocity over the magnetic field times the radius. This is something we're going to use later in the year when we come back to this. Uh, and now, well, I found this is why I needed this. I needed the velocity of the particle in the field. I needed the strength of the field and the radius of curvature. I have all that. So I can find this charge to mass ratio. As I said earlier, what Thompson did is when he had this number, um, he uh, well, he didn't do anything with this. When he found this number, he was done because he didn't know Q or M. But Millikan was able to figure out Q, so he got credited with finding the mass of the electron as well. All right, so let's go through and plug in what we get. We know that 
this should come out to the value for the proton. So we'll plug in our velocity. Okay, the magnetic field is 0 0.8 teslas. And the radius here is in millimeters we need to convert. Okay, if you do that calculation there, you get a charge to mass ratio of 9.58 times 10 to the 7. Okay, so um, if we go through and we actually look at this particular example, if this experiment was done in a lab, if we had this set up, um, we'd find out that this particle that we sent through was a proton. Um, Again, to review for C, so we found here that it is the proton going through. Uh, C, what physics principles were used? Well, we, the first part of the problem was finding the velocity. You could have done that with kinematics. So there's two possible answers here. You could say unbalanced forces first, using the fact that the particle is accelerating between the plates. You could say unbalanced forces. And then here, where we did this analysis, this was balanced forces. Okay? So... Um, it could either be unbalanced forces and then balanced forces. Um, the thing is, when I solve this, I actually use conservation of energy. That change in V is equal to change in E over Q. It's an expression that involves conservation of energy. That energy is converted from one form to another. So you could have conservation of energy first and then balanced forces uh, for the second part. Um, D, so imagine the charge in the particle was reversed. What effect would that have? Um, twofold. First off, you can see between the plates, right, the left plate is positive and the right plate's negative. So if you put a negative particle in there, it's going to go left, not right. So it wouldn't even enter the magnetic field. So your apparatus would be garbage. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to me measure any radius at all. So what would you have to do? Well, first, if it was a negative particle between the plates, you'd have to switch it so that the right plate was positive and the left plate was negative. And then the other thing, when it went into the magnetic field, we said with the hand rules, if it's a negative particle, it would come through like this between the plates. The field is out of the page for the magnetic field. So it would actually curl the particle up like this. Okay? And by doing that, you, you'd have to have a screen above O. And it's not shown here how far this screen extends, but you basically have to have a screen up above because the particle would come up and hit the screen above. Okay, so those are the main two ramifications there of changing the sign on the particle. Um, and yes, as I said, this is a great problem. It involves a lot of the principles we talked about in the unit. And this is going to come up again. We are going to do this same analysis in our nuclear physics unit when we look at uh, cathode rays and charge to mass ratio.